We calling in the hogs today on Appalachia at you. We'll be talking about raising your own pork, hobby farming, and much more. We have a special guest today talking about his experience in raising hogs and processing them. Let's dive right on in. Good evening out there to you in this Tennessee mountain land. Coming at you today, talking pork. On right off the bat, we call them the hogs. We got a good show lined up for you today, especially if you ever want to raise your own pigs. But even if you don't raise your own pigs, the the history of, of that going on in the home place in southern Appalachia uh, is tremendous. So. Let's dive right on in and look at some of the information that you may need if you are talking about uh, wanting to have your own pork, processing it. There's a lot to learn. So let's look at it as if you're going to raise some pigs or are you just kind of curious about what folks used to do, how they had a smokehouse on their farm or on their homestead, having their own meat there. So uh, if you're ever considering getting some pigs, it's called feeder pigs, and uh, Extension has a wealth of information here, but really what you got to consider is do you have the space, and the uh, good news is it doesn't require a whole lot of space, you know, if you're talking just for your family, but uh, consider um, the space that you need and the right temperature. Usually when you're going to do this, it's going to be seasonal. You're not going to be raising pigs all year long, but usually you'll start in May. And then there'll be appropriate market size between 250, 280 pounds by November is what you're looking at. So later on the show, the show me and my buddy talk about picking a date for a good hog killing uh, to get that pork. But uh, usually it's from May to November is when you're raising them. But uh, if you want to raise pigs, you need to consider heat. Uh, they like to have around 70 degrees uh, temperature. So you may need to have some heat if it's colder than that. And obviously, if it's hot in the summer, you might need to have some areas. Not might. You definitely do need to have some areas for them, those pigs to be able to cool down. But uh, the good thing, they don't require a lot of space as far as uh, what they need. Minimal space, depending on whether you choose to house pigs inside or outside. Uh, but for growing pigs, it's recommended that you plant around eight square feet of space per pig. And I know this sounds small, but they're not terribly active animals. Their behavior of choice are sleeping, eating, and rooting. If you don't know what rooting is, you'll soon find out if you get a pig. Uh, that is where they root around to eat. They can be uh, pretty destructive. They can cause a lot of mud, a lot of issues. Got to have good fencing. They are smart animals. I often say that they're the smartest animal on the farm. But um, but leave the leave the running to horses. They don't have to have a whole lot of pasture or anything. But uh, if they are outdoors, plan on them ripping up soil, create large holes in muddy area, uh, areas. If you have pasture, you should manage pastures for high traffic area, and that'll help manage the damage that pigs can cause to the landscape. But also, you know, look at the manure management standpoint. Uh, they're going to be messy, but they are natural excavators and they'll try to dig out of any pen. Very smart to get out of. But what you feed them, you know, I want to talk later with our guests, but uh, we grew up feeding a lot of table scraps, which we didn't know any better. But thanks to Extension and some good research, we know that that's not the best thing to do. You know, table scraps should be considered a treat for a pig and really no meat. You don't want to feed a pig any meat, especially uncooked meat that can lead to disease and some other issues. But you need a lot of high protein. If you don't have a way to mix your own grain, you may want to consider buying commercial blends. It's always a good option. But you want a lot of protein. Pigs under 50 pounds 
uh, 50 pounds to about 200 need a lot higher protein than those over 200 pounds. So a lot of uh, things to consider. So how much meat are you going to get from it? Well, uh, the whole cuts are generally two of each, and we're going to break down a pig later on in the show. But chops, roast, racks of ribs, you have the hams or whole, sliced. Shoulder, you get the roast and pulled pork. And the belly, you get the bacon and the pieces. I love it. And even the miscellaneous, liver, heart, stomach, casings, feet, jowls, pork rinds, or cracklings all. Pork cracklings is one of my favorite. Go get old crackling cornbread. If you've never had it, you can't buy it where it's as good as homemade. But ground pork uh, creates scrapple. If you haven't had scrapple, look that up. That's a big uh, uh, type of uh, sausage or mixture that's real, real popular up in Rhode Island and New England area. And, of course, sausages. It's delicious. And even sauce. If you haven't tried sauce, don't knock it yet. Homemade sauce is a different ball game. But we're going to give you tips. And if you try what we tell you, you'll never be able to eat just regular popcorn again. But generally speaking, that's what you're going to get at harvest. We have some good publications if you are going to take that step and start raising your own pigs. So if you have questions on what you need, how to get started, of course, your county extension office is going to be your first resource there. But uh, our friends to the south of us have a good publication on how to transport, transport purchasing feeder pigs. Buy them from one farm. You don't want them commingled or as much, uh, keep them in less commingled as you can. Have good health and vaccine records, including parasite control. So a, finish, a pig finisher must reduce the stress and sale of fatigue, thirst, hunger, social problems. And ideally, you're going to keep them pretty consistent. Consistent temperature, uh, you need to have them uh, being able to free feed after, you, after the first initial three to four uh, uh, days of having them. Uh, they have a lot of stress on them for, uh, at front uh, end of this process, but having them free feed, provide them with ample amount of water. There's all different kinds of breeds and characteristics of domesticated pig. Uh, our coworker has some cooney coonies and uh, they feed banana pills or like candy to them. So you can feed some table scraps done correctly, but should be as a treat instead of a, of a good diet plan. But I want to help uh, introduce our next speaker. He's going to uh, tell about his experience of raising hogs, what you need to do it, because it can be intimidating, uh, you know, f uh, feeding these pigs, finishing them off, but the, but the project's really rewarding. Again, this is a quick process from May to November, from 50 to 280 pounds in that short amount of time. So uh, you can get a good turnaround and good product. But Let's uh, let's help welcome Travis Henson on the show. He's in the cerebral rocking chair today. So let's hear what my good friend has uh, on his mind about raising your own pork. All right. We have a special guest today on the Appalachia podcast. Today's theme is raising hogs, calling the hogs. So. Uh, we were going to talk a little bit about raising hogs and finishing them out. And a big part of the culture here in Tennessee, uh, across the state is, is, uh, raising hogs growing up in Southern Appalachia. We raised hogs to live off of, didn't make any money off of them, just self-consumption. But, uh, there's a lot of interest in raising and producing your own food and pork is certainly no different, but it does take a little, little bit of, uh, knowledge to go at it. There's a lot to learn and we want to help, uh, kind of curve that back, but, we have Travis here. He has a lot of experience in, in doing his own hogs, been doing it for several years now and can provide some insight for us. And, uh, you know, first step you got to consider is are you raising your own hogs or are you, are you buying hogs? And um, there are some thoughts, pros and cons for that. But Travis, speak to that about, you know, raising your own hogs or, or uh, buying them there. Uh, thank you, Ron. Uh, the only thing I can say is if you've never done it, uh, I think you should try it with your family. Uh, if you don't have a family and you just want to do it, go ahead and give it a whirl. Uh, there's a lot of things to be said about knowing what you're eating and uh, just uh, realizing that the food that you're putting in your mouth and down your throat is actually something you help do and raise and 
you know what all you give it? No steroids, no nothing. And uh, I do not do that anymore. Uh, I found out, just like every other small town person, most of the time it's uh, cheaper to buy it on the hoof now than it is to raise your own. I, I went as far as even growing my own corn. Uh, we used a lot of truckers' favorite. Uh, we've had some Neil Paymaster, some old white corn from an old farmer. Uh, we've tried everything we could think of, uh, soaking the feed. Uh, it's definitely a payoff there. Mm -hmm. At the end, I was where I could raise the hogs. I was putting around 2.8, 2.5 pounds per day on a hog, which is kind of unheard of around here. But uh, I was doing it, just very mm -hmm. costly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, it's a great thing to do with family, especially with kids, something great for them to learn. Oh yeah. And, uh, you know, working with kids, seeing that complete agriculture chain is a real benefit. We did it with chickens, you know, it's the same concept with chickens. You know, you raise them from two day old chicks all the way out to egg, egg producing egg laying hens, but with pork, you know, getting that, getting that piglet and raising up and teaching your kids about animal husbandry and, and, uh, proper ag techniques. But, you know, it's amazing how much these hogs can put on now. We've really gotten advanced in, in feeding their supplemental feeding. We have kids that show hogs, and a show hog's a little different. You want to finish it out pretty quick, and places like Co-op and Trash Supply definitely have that feed to do that. But you had mentioned something that's pretty interesting. So you tried to offset some of that cost with growing your own uh, uh, feed for the hogs, right? Is that what you were saying? Yes, sir, I did. Uh, we, we've done that actually for several years. I had me and a uh, family member or cousin of mine, Randall Henson. Uh, we both got back into farming more where our grandparents and things did it before, and we got back into it. Uh, we traditionally turned the ground versus row cropping it, and at the end when I had to leave it and get back out of it, uh, he got back into no-till property. Uh, but, yeah, we tried everything we could. Uh, to raise them efficiently and get the most, uh, I guess, bang for your buck, with the old saying goes. Yeah, and, you know, growing up, we didn't know much, uh, you know, and, and uh, we didn't, I grew up on the side of a mountain, so we never fed them the best, you know, we didn't put a lot of weight on our hogs, we, I hate to say it, but fed them scraps and everything, and that's not always, you know, the best because of nutrition quality, and they don't put on as much weight, but um, you definitely ha having wholesome products to feed them, and you know, that'll be a good project for your children, too. Like you said, if they grew up on the farm, learning how to grow those crops, the, the grain and things to supplement that feeding and, and anything to help, you know, cut the cost. We want to try to try to minimize that, especially if you're doing it on your own, I'd imagine. But about what poundage of, of uh, hog are you looking at before you uh, uh, harvest that and, and uh, start the process problem, Travis? Uh, we preferred them to be over the 300 range. Uh, we found that the best hog for us to kill was around the 325 to 350 range. Uh, if you go back, and we've tried it, we have killed some that was around 900 pounds down here. And it was not for us, it was for other people's hogs that mm -hmm. they would bring in. Cause it's, like, it's like a community thing that we do. Yeah. Uh, we just happened to be fortunate enough to We've worked and got our own place here that done it, and we've worked through the years to build what we had. But the bigger hogs are good for making the lard, rendering the lard. If you want to cook with that natural grease, which we like to do, and we make a lot of crackling. And we biggest thing that's happened over the last fifteen years, I would say, is popcorn. I actually make a lot of popcorn mm. to give out to a lot of people, yeah. uh, but. I don't use as much of the lard anymore as I used to. Now I'm trying to actually get into making some soap and a few more things with the lard. So uh, I'm trying to find more uses for the lard besides just cooking. Yeah. Um, but I, I remember my grandmother would make the soap out of some. And boy, that stuff comes in handy. That'll take whatever's off of you. Or, or it's a great to wash your hands with. And it's real. Real, real quality stuff when you make it yourself there. Yes, sir, it is. Mm -hmm. But uh, let's talk about, you know, we can, we can, we can go back and talk about, you know, raising and finish it, but let's take it from where you're, where you decided that you're going to 
going to do a hog killing, whether it's 350 pounds or, or we used to do it a little bit uh, smaller than that just because it was just me and a, me and my grandmother uh, doing it. We would do, do them a little bit smaller, but um, whether it's a, you know, a, a 200 pound hog or 350 and 900 pounds, even this is, this comes in play even more, but what kind of equipment and what kind of things should you have prepared for that day that you decide that you're going to take that hog? Um, a lot of strong backs usually help a lot. Uh, we usually try to get in, uh, we built our own starters. Uh, Mm. you would need some kind of either tractor is what we use, or again, there is manpower, but we figured out a ways to use tractors with front end loaders or a boom pole. And we'd lower that down into the vat of hot water. Uh, you want some really sharp knives when you get ready to dress the hog, but you need some that's not as sharp to scrape them to get all the hair off. We like to get the water between 165 and around 177, somewhere in there. Uh, a lot of the old timers that come down to help sometimes, they would always drag their finger through it and they say, well, if my nail didn't come off the third time, I believe the water's about hot. I didn't want to reach back for the fourth. Yeah. So uh, yeah. that was their way of measuring how hot the water was. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, none of our hands is as tough as theirs. So uh, we used thermometers and cheated. Mm -hmm. So uh, with that being said, you'll need some way to get it back off of the table. We used a old uh, chain hoist for a while. And then we kind of got to where we used a winch system. And we just put a battery outside the wall and hooked the cables up and pushed the button. Yeah. Raise the hog up, and from there we would either block it out hanging up or lay it on the table. And yeah. it's but you need a lot of manpower, and if you don't have the manpower, it's just a lot slower. I have killed it by myself. Uh, it's just a lot of work. Uh, you better be yeah. prepared for a long day. Yeah, we used to do the uh, you know similar things. Our we would have family that come that had some hogs, and we all worked together and. And we had scalding vats. And for y'all that don't know what that is, uh, Travis can talk about what he's got set up. But we had we had basically a half of a metal trough that we laid down. We filled it full of that hot water. And uh, we would use a, a, a thermometer or whatever we had to get that temperature up around 155, 160. And um, I've even seen people, when you have the equipment, if you have a standing up barrel, they can dip it, you know, and... Uh, pull it back out. Obviously the size of pig that you use is going to dictate what's more feasible for that. But, um, you know, get that in the, in the, in, in the scrape it, but uh, that waters, you know, loosens up those hair follicles and cleans that up because your cracklings, as you mentioned, that's got part of the skin on it. So you want, you want it to be clean and uh, clear. Is that what kind of your scalding bats look like, Travis? Is a kind of a half moon, or, or do you dunk them? Or yes, they are a half moon. Uh, they was actually uh, the one that I built onto and built off of the ground was actually the half of an old 1800s locomotive wow. uh, steam engine part that was riveted together that still holds together. Uh, wow. And I welded some ends into it, and we done it from there and put snow chains actually to use to rotate the hog to flip it and put hooks on both sides of that half moon bat. Mm -hmm. And from there on the back side of that table, I mean, on the back side of the bat is the table and we would roll it out and that's where we would scrape the hair. Um, but there again, like I said, you really need some help uh, if you don't have it, but it's, you, you manage and figure out ways to do things. Mm -hmm. And the smaller hogs that you was referring to, we did kill some of those smaller hogs and we've used the barrels, especially around certain times of the year when we didn't want to get the big scalder that much water hot. Because most of the time I had to start the fires around 3.30 to 4 o'clock in the morning, uh, depending on how cold it was underneath that, because I would heat mine with wood. And to get it ready by 7 o'clock to kill, I had to be water rolling pretty good. By then, mm -hmm. so you know, like I said, it's long days and early mornings, but the reward still is there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
um, I'm just going to let you know, or your camera went out, but that, or, but your, uh, or, but everything's going else good. I just want to be aware that I can't see you, but that's, there's no need to fix that. I just want to let you know in case you need me, I can't see you, but, um, on the zoom, but, um, uh, uh, but going back to what, you know, we talked about, you mentioned that on a good cold day, and that's really when we like to do it. you know, on a, on a, on a real cold day, it helps with meat processing and, uh, food safety as, as well. You, or you go to your butcher shop, you walk in that cooler, it's going to be about 38 degrees, uh, in that butcher shop. So, uh, a good cold day. And I, or I'll tell you what, uh, I learned through the, uh, through the school. And I thought this was pretty genius when you're doing smaller hogs you know if you're doing a hog that's you know under 200 pounds or, or whatever you could take your and a and an old man taught me this you could uh, take that whatever your that kettle is that you're heating up that water he would heat it to 150 100 160 and then he would dunk a hot towel in that bat of water and that a big towel like a beach towel and if it's good enough size it'll cover that littler hog And he would lay that hot towel over and then he'd take a take a ladle and keep pouring that hot water on that towel till it gets saturated. And then that towel would hold in that heat and loosen up those hair follicles. And, you know, he found a way because he's doing it by himself, you know, you know, uh, ingenuity trying to trying to get the job done. And he would loosen up those hair follicles that way. And, uh, you know, a, a good scraper. They even sell these things. I don't know if you've ever used them, Travis, but they look like a candlestick holder. They have a, they have a blunt Yeah. end. It looks like a, like the end of a coffee mug, and they hold it, and they'll come and they'll scrape it, and it and it keeps it because you're not trying to shave the pig. It looks like you're trying to shave it, but you're not. You're not really trying to, trying to shave it. You're trying to, trying to scrape those hair follicles loose, and there's some tougher air uh, errors than. The knot, uh, I, I remember around the head and the toes and being, being kind of tough areas to get. And uh, another. We uh we used the burlap sacks. When you were talking about the towels, we did keep old burlap sacks for years until they got rot. But the biggest uh ingredient that we added to the water, I forgot to mention, was actually ash. Uh, the old timers timers told me they would use lye, but ash has the lye in it, so we would actually put the ash in the water, and it would help the hair release off of the hog Oh, a lot wow. of times. Yeah. And One a guy brought his special shovel down. He only used every year to do that hole, and he kept it filed down with a file, and he would almost have that hole scraped in that vat before we ever hit the table with it. That's great. He was really slick with that shovel, Yeah. and Yeah. uh, he was the one that taught me that with the axe. Yeah. But tricks of the trade, you know, you'll learn this as you, as you get going on. Anything to make that job easier. Cause it's a, it's a, it's a day long job. I mean, from, Oh, yeah. from, from start to finish. I mean, you're up at three thirty, four o'clock, starting that fire, heating that water. And it takes a while to get that water to temp. And then, you know, the, the uh, back power to, to, or to get that hog in there and, and that's situated. But, um, after you, uh, after you, uh, scald it, do y'all hang your hogs? Uh, is that the next step? Uh, we traditionally do not hang our hogs. We uh, are looking to get into that one day. We just have not had the place to do that for ours to chill because of the winters. We really don't have numerous days of cold weather for it to hang there anymore. But what we do is we go ahead and block it out, and we put that meat up for at least two days, cut up into the pieces that we know we're going to work up so it chills out faster. And some of it we actually do start work on the next day because we usually bring in deep freezes and get the certain parts like the ribs or the pork chops froze up pretty hard in there so we can go ahead and cut those up. And the hams, if we're going to salt them in the bacon, we let those kind of the animal heat get out of it naturally with the air and cold air. Mm hmm yeah yeah that's a good point so um what's some of your favorite parts after you after you got it scraped and you're actually doing the meat cutting what are some of your favorite cuts and uh, parts to get from that Um, I, I would say, honestly, I, 
it would probably be the hams because of the way we cut them and we take care of them. The inside loin's always the biggest, I guess the smallest or the biggest part of the hog that everybody looks forward to getting. Mm-hmm. But uh, if people want it boneless, you know, I do them hanging right then. If they want them with the bone in, pork chops, I mean, we have to have that meat all ready for that the next day. Uh, we do that as well. But uh, we found out instead of using axes and hatchets to split the hog, I started using a cordless saw saw. And we started out actually with a cord saw saw uh, to cut those hogs right in half and to get them up there to the barn to where we could work them. Mm-hmm. But uh, that was another tool that I forgot. We actually have old hand saws that we still use meat saws. And uh, I still split one every year. Uh, we killed 13 again this year. And I split one again this year all the way down the middle just to remind myself how easy it is to pull the trigger on that saw. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, uh, there's a lot of resources out there. And once you get, you know, ready to ready to um, uh, do that, I'm going to share my screen and I'll show everybody what I'm looking at. But, uh, you know, you have, uh, you know, the hog here and it's broke down into what they call primal and subprimal cuts. And, you know, Travis had mentioned and Travis can check me here, but are 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 you seeing this peak pig, Travis, that's broken up? Yes, I am. Yes, sir. So uh you have the ham here that um that that section, you have the loin, the butt, which a lot of people, you know, the Boston butt's a big popular cut. A lot of people uh confuse that with the ham, but it actually comes from the top of the shoulder. And then you have the picnic. And my favorite part, which uh, as uh, many of the listeners know, I, I, I can't eat pork or beef. It's awful. Uh, I would give up everything if I could have all the other meat, if I could have pork back. I mean, I miss pork the most. You can't have a good breakfast without pork. <laughs> but my I'm sure I agree with part, you. Oh, man. My favorite part was the jowl. You know, if you're a good old hog jaw or uh, you take uh, you take a, a pig on a spiff or or a luau, whatever you do, if you get that jaw meat, it's sweet and it's real, uh, real fatty, real flavorful. Uh, that's one of my favorite. And you got the the uh, spare ribs and the belly, but uh, you can do bacon, and uh, that's really you know something special to the uh, the uh, domesticated pig. You have the ability to get that that bacon. If you kill a wild hog, uh, from my experience, you know, for one, that you're not going to be able to do as as easy of a job cleaning that wild hog up as you are a domesticated pig as, as woolly as those boogers are. But you can take a take it and even if you clean it, they don't even have the meat there. So these domesticated pig species, they have enough meat and everything on that belly to get ribs or the bacon, I'm sorry. And the only other critter that I know that has bacon is bear. So you can actually get bacon off of a bear, but um that's a special part too. But these are your big, your big primals. Those are the big areas. If we were looking at the beef animal, that would be the things like the round, the chuck, the loin, the short loin. Same thing for a pig. It's just called different. Instead of a round on a on a on a pig, it's called the ham, and you have the loin instead of short loin and sirloin and all that. As far as a primal, and then it's broke down even further, and um, you can. Uh, you can actually get into your uh, subprimals, uh, which is your uh, big sections, and then your retail cuts. So from that loin section, you're going to get your your pork chops. And if you have a meat, uh, 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 really, if you're doing this at home, you're probably not going to have access to this. I don't know if uh, you do, Travis, but if you have a bandsaw or a way to cut those pork chops. Oh, I do. Oh, great, great. So. Uh, if you have a way to do that, depending on how you turn that loin with the bone on it, you know, the first several cuts are going to be a different pork chop versus, you know, in the section, but then you have the mix, but you have a rib end and you have the loin end. And what makes a pork chop is if it has a piece of vertebrae in it. So, uh, so if it has a piece of vertebrae in it, it's a chop. If it does not, it's a steak. So, um in lamb if you see any cut that has the chop at the end of it it has a piece of vertebrae in it so you know it's along the back 
but you can get those chops off of that loin section with the with with the with the bone in you get a different variety but if you do it boneless you're you're pretty much getting just no just uh just a loin a loin's chop but you can you can play with that and then um you can take these ribs further down here and you can uh there's a spare ribs and then there's a the short ribs depending on the number of bones that you count back but you could get real technical in it and your ham uh you know you, you have the hawks which is more used for seasoning and you have the um the picnic and the boston butt but you use everything but the squeal you can if you want to <laughs> from the rudder to the tater that's right so uh you can you can have a lot of fun with it uh we had mentioned cracklings. Cracklings is another favorite of mine. That's part of the skin. That's, you know, one of the main, my main reason why I want to do it this way, because I want to get the cracklings and I want to use that, that hide. If you skin it, you don't, you don't get that, but that skin's very, very flavorful and, and uh, worth the, worth the work in my opinion. But, um, you you have all kinds of fat and you have the 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 loin cuts there even some of the organs i know that uh some people enjoy liver i prefer the the um the uh, pork liver more than the beef liver uh, some people are all opposite some people don't care much for it at all but um and we see kidneys in the butcher shop some are not a whole lot but there's opportunities there but we don't knock it to big, big feet and the rest of the head we cut it up almost man sauce mm -hmm. uh we do make the south meat uh we boil that and do we do use the feet there's some people we give the feet to that want it mm -hmm. but uh most of the time we will actually leave those for the farm animals or we don't use them all uh, yeah. the dogs let them chew on those a while oh, and yeah. but most of the time we usually use the feet and the tail if they have a tail and yeah. uh, put that in the south meat. Yeah, we, uh, we, we kept the feet cause my mama cooked them. She, she, she they locked them. Um, they would boil them. And then there is pickled pig's feet <laughs> that some people yeah. find pretty grotesque. I actually like it, <laughs> but, uh, you, but it's kind of a preferred, uh, preferred cut. It's not, you know, something that you may, may want to do, but certainly can be used. So, uh, you mentioned souse meat, and I tell folks that you know you see souse meat in the store; it's packaged as jelly, ah. jellified. Uh, don't don't knock homemade souse meat until you've tried it. It's, uh, to me, yeah, it's never never knock it. Mm -mm. That's exactly right. No, and I've or or uh, when I lived in in Hohenwall there, I remember you giving me some homemade souse meat, and it changed changed my mind. Uh, a total are totally different different um and you'd mentioned popcorn once you have popcorn part uh, or uh, popped in that lard butter that is that is hard to beat it's hard to go back to regular popcorn oh it is yeah extremely hard yeah but uh, there's a lot going on here but uh you can you can get these references the extension office has different cuts of meat uh, that you can look at charts we have available um different different publications but uh there's a lot of resources out there from the port checkoff that's a national uh information or, or a way to get information the university of florida here has a or has a good retail identification cut that when i done 4-h and uh in lewis county and in florida in florida we actually had the state champions uh meet judging team in middle school but uh it kind of breaks it down in these subprimals, and you have all these different varieties of of uh, pork to go from, but they have sections from the ham and the leg, the loin, shoulder, side belly, and the various would be the stuff like the kidneys, the liver, um, and also the kind of the processed stuff, the sausage and in the and the, and the um, ground pork, bacon. Like, uh, bacon. Bacon, country ham, and that's something that we don't see a lot of anymore. Is making your own country ham at one time 4-H, and uh, certain counties have still have participation in it. But they used to be a country ham project, and some counties still compete. But 
where they actually make their own country ham. And uh, before I left to go to Florida, I was a country ham judge of the Lawrence and Giles County Fair. <laughs> it was always a, it was always that's a, a fun, good, fun thing that's to a great judge. Thing to judge there. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, you don't get to taste it when you're judging a lot of people. Oh, they just you know, took all the miles yeah, away from us. Yeah. So, uh, for the country ham, you want it to have a teardrop shape. Looks like a teardrop coming down. And then there's an H bone. And there's a sweet spot in that country ham where you're going to get the best slices. So you wanted a wide spot there by the H bone where you're going to cut it. And also the seasoning and the smell. So you had to have a probe. And you would take a probe and you'd go into that country ham at certain locations. And then you'd pull it out and you'd take a smell and you'd want that nice country ham smell. Nothing uh, off odors or sweet. You know, you'd want that cure. But uh, back in the day, you know, growing up, we had a smokehouse and, and we had to have our own uh, country ham we made and uh, cured our own meat and put back. So uh, it was a big deal. And certain counties still do that. Um there's a there's a county out in West Tennessee, Benton County. I think it has Clifty Farms. They they uh, yeah, they I, sell uh, they they sell you know they have a good market on the on the country ham, um, that old salty ham. But I love it. I actually liked it better than city ham. <laughs> I miss yeah, it. Yeah, I'm the same way. Mm -hmm. But um, you know you cook pork really well. There's not a grading system in pork. Like there is beef, there's no uh, prime or choice, but uh, qual our quality pork has a certain color and a, and, a, and a fat content to it, uh, depending on, you know, what cut you're looking at. But uh, tell us about some of the stuff that you like to make with it. You'd mentioned souse meat. Do you make any sauces? Do you have grinders and all that? Uh, yes, uh, we put together a uh, an old grinder. Uh, it was kind of like a team effort on that one as well. I had a man that gave it to me. It was uh, came out of an old grocery store several miles from here. Uh, it was actually it was still the biggest grinder that I guess they still make is the number thirty two head, and uh, they didn't want it. And it was a pile of rust when I got it. And uh, I took some sanding and some time and some tender loving care and a lot of oil and grease and actually lard that I'd had left over and. Got it back going really good, and it's run off of belts. And uh, the other friends I had, and with the help of Randall, they all designed that thing where it was on a uh, lawnmower pulley with a sawmill five-horse electric motor that run off a of 220. Mm -hmm. So now we plug it up every year, and when we do, you can the temperature's right with all the meat. We can grind about a thousand pounds an hour. Uh, mm -hmm. But we do grind our own sausage. That's the biggest thing that most people come down here to do is to grind the sausage. But um, cutting it all up is that band saw's work and then the cracklings and like I said, rendering out the lard. But uh, yeah, it's a, it's one thing that I really enjoy is that grinder takes a lot of manpower out. And we also figured out last year, uh, we've, none of us has ever tried it. We started making brats. And uh, and Dewey sausage this year, mm. and uh, a couple more things just to figure out different ways that we all love pork. So we mm. just started making different things with it. Yeah, yeah. No, I haven't got into that. I bet that would be good. I've made summer sausage and but and uh, other things. I haven't really got to dry it, but uh, that's another great product that that can come from it. Uh, if you don't have a grinder, if you're wanting to get into this, not all grinders are equal. Uh, it's hard to find a good grinder. Uh, you're going to pay money for a good grinder. And really, you need at least, uh, you know, Travis may have different thoughts, but I think you need at least a horsepower or or, or one horsepower yeah. grinder. I mean, you're going to save yourself a lot of, a lot of heartache if you have a, yeah. have one that's bigger, more powerful, because... Uh, what happens is when you have one that's not up to uh, up to standard is it'll start gumming it up and it'll start mushing it and instead of grinding it it'll just kind of gum it and it's it doesn't taste as good it's more mess and um, some of these cuts they they don't grind well as, as you think anyways I mean it takes a pretty wholesome product to grind it's not just you know we get this 
idea that it's just a bunch of scrap meat and stuff that's being thrown in a grinder, but really it takes good wholesome product, a good, good, um, good chunks of meat to grind. And what I like doing is I, you know, I've never just ground on the spot. Usually I get that meat cold and, uh, to me, it, and to me, it kind of grinds better. You got it, got it cut thick and it's cold. It's just, you know, in the thrown out process and it goes by and, we actually purchased uh, a grinder and that grinder will get hot on you. And that also, you know, affects the meat quality, but they make these grinders now, Travis, I don't know if you've seen them, but they got ice packs that you can wrap around the grinder. No, I have not seen it. So around the grinder, around the auger, on the outside, it has this sleeve you put over, you fill it with ice and it keeps your grinder cool as it spits out. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah. So the the funniest part about this old grinder is it actually has a greased alamite on the very back of it. Yeah. So we actually do grease it with just black grease, but the black grease never does reach the auger. Yeah. And I guess something about the grease actually keeps that grinder pretty cool. Mm -hmm. But the pot metal on it, I, it's made out of an old casting pot metal type steel, mm -hmm. but it's so heavy. I would hate to know how much it actually weighs. I mean, yeah. I, I would say it's probably a couple hundred pounds easily when it's assembled. Or, or, or I believe I've seen it years ago, um, but it was like an old industry, or was it a, a Holbert? Yes. Or... I believe you're right. I believe yeah. that is correct. Yeah, yeah, and they still make equipment today, um, but uh, that belt, you know, they're made today where they run off of a motor, and they don't have a belt and that motor turns yeah. that auger and it gets, that's where that heat, a, a, a lot of that heat comes from is goes up into it the It makes metal. sense. Mm -hmm. I like the thought of uh, actually just chilling that metal before we actually grind it just with cold meat. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I'll touch back on something you was talking about with the one horse grinder. I would agree as much with the size as I would the throat. Mm-hmm of that to handle the bigger cuts of meat because you're going to wear yourself out and you're going to dull a lot of knives cutting up the meat so small to get through the other grinders. Yeah. That was the thing that we realized. Uh, we haven't seen but one or two whole back loins uh, that wouldn't have fit right down the grinder's throat and just shut out the other end of it. I mean, mm -hmm. it's a big grinder. I know that. And, uh, but they still make those big grinders. They're just very expensive. And sometimes you can find them at flea markets and certain auctions. Uh, yeah. If you plan yeah. on doing a lot of what we're talking about, I'd recommend the bigger one, the biggest you can get. Yeah, because it's, it's going to be a, an investment. If you're going to do this, you're going to want something like that that you're not having to fight with and, and fuss and uh, get the job done. Because if you try to use one and, uh, we had a little hand grinder that we tried to even do deer with, and that gets old. Yes, sir. I agree with you. You know, but I have seen people like if you're pretty good with making stuff, I, or I bet a man could take a take that handheld grinder and uh, put some kind of system like that and make it into a a mechanical one if you had the belt. You know, uh, you you can. Uh, we tried two or three of the hand grinders when we first got started putting electric drills on them. We put them with air, and all we done was break the bolts off the ends. Mm -hmm. I think you had the right idea. If you put a bigger wheel on the back with a belt, you would probably do that. It don't have to turn fast. It just mm -hmm. has to turn consistent and strong. Yeah. And that was something we was young and dumb and not really paying attention. We were trying to hurry and not do something yeah the right way yeah well and you'll learn like if you get into this you'll learn as you go and uh when you have difficult difficulty with certain aspects you're going to find a way to make it easier on you <laughs> every time or every you're not time gonna, or you're not going to enjoy doing it and this is something that can be very enjoyable and a great product for your family um can, or can you speak on, like, if you're doing your 350-pound hog, about once it's said and done, and I know this is very variable, depends on what kind of cuts you want, but you got to make sure you have the freezer space, right? Oh, yes. 
Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Oh, so, uh, yeah, you want a lot of that. Um, yeah. Yeah. But I'm I'm trying to remember on every hog that was 300 pounds plus every gut that we got out the entrails of the hog always weighed between 80 and 95 pounds. It was a 15 pound window. And that was, I weighed so many of them that it was always in that area, but it was always closer to 90 pounds than it was any. So you can take that right off the top with your liver, heart, intestines and all. And, you know, I, I know you're losing a lot, but at the same time, a lot of people eat those and use those. We do not. Uh, we do give the livers away. Some of the hearts, yes. Uh, the rest of it, we did not. We figured wildlife had to eat as well. So um, that was just the way we have done it. Mm -hmm. There is better ways, I know, but uh, the the weight difference is there. I, I never have really kept up with it precisely on that. Um, I wish I would do better with about that, but I do not. Um, mm -hmm. I leave that up to more educated people than me to fight that fight. Yeah. Uh, just too busy going through so many hogs mm -hmm. that we don't pay attention to that part except for the I usually take all the innards out of about every hog we do because I'm usually so fast, but it's just been years of experience. And I, I would say that you're gonna probably get I guess around the sixty percent range, maybe, if you're lucky. But it's probably more fifty fifty. Well if you take the hooks and head and all that off. And if you yeah. don't eat south, you're gonna you're probably not gonna get the sixty for sure. And well, we um, or I've done this a lot with beef cattle, uh, you know, because most beef cattle is taken to a processor, and um, you know, being on this side of the chair, you know, with, with with meat science, we get calls from farmers in the extension office about taking their uh, their uh, steers or their their uh, beef animal to a to a processor, and there's sometimes hard feelings about the amount of meat they get back, and you know. When you take in a in a a, a twelve hundred pound steer, you know they're expecting a lot of meat back. But as you mentioned, you know you have gut feel that that goes out the window. You have uh, the hide, and there's a lot of variables into that. How are the are are how you have it cut? If you're doing boneless versus bone in cuts, if you're doing, you know, a lot of ground that's going to affect your take home product, and. Uh, I'm or I'm telling you on a beef animal, and I could see it being similar around pork. Probably you probably have a little bit less loss on pork, but uh, I or, or I tell folks, you know, you're looking at forty percent hit, uh, hitting about forty percent, and that's taking an animal that's all that's alive off the scale from that weight. You can get a much better estimate if you know how much of that or that that chilled carcass weight is. So if you know Correct. how much the carcass weighs, not the live animal, you can get a lot better estimate off of about how much take-home product you're going to have. And, you know, and that's another reason why some folks do their own, you know. Uh, there's nothing wrong with businesses and there's nothing wrong with processors. I know a lot of them are across the state that are really good. But when you do it yourself, you know how that meat's being handled and you also know what conditions it's in. And so you also get a better better idea of, of uh, what you have looking at and you have a specific um a, a, or like if you have a specific way you want to cut that hog uh, you can or, or 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 you know you're going to get that done but um you know and like beef you know they'll want a beef animal to hang for 17 days and that's and that's hard to accomplish because that that freezer space for a processor is money yeah that makes sense too Mm hmm. But uh, but, uh, you know, I bet it's even less with pork because, you know, we're dealing with a little bit different, different animal, a different kind of meat and everything. But if you have that carcass weight, you're going to have a have a better estimate. But there is places yeah. around where I'm at that will still do it for you if you're just in, interested in raising the hogs and, and taking them off. But uh, that's like me deer hunting. You know, I always wanted to do the start from the finish. I don't take mine to a processor, not nothing wrong with it, but I like knowing every step of the line. You know, I like to, you know, to be in it. I think you should at least understand and know how it's done. And that will save you some confusion and, and heartache later when 
you don't think that you're getting all your meat back. <laughs> I agree. And, the, you know, the best part about if you've never done it and you showed the diagram on how the hogs are cut up, I personally never had those diagrams. I was fortunate enough to work in a meat department in a grocery store years ago when I was just a young fellow that didn't know the right end of a knife and how to use one exactly. But I also learned to watch and pay attention to what comes through and then pick up on enough uh, from the older men that I watched and got to help kill hogs. But if you don't cut it up exactly the way that those diagrams are, I know I do not. There's nothing wrong with it. As long as you enjoy what you're eating and the way that you do it and the way I do it, every person that comes around says, you know what? That makes it look a little easier, and I'm not feeling like I'm going to mess up something. And the old saying goes, what you don't get on one piece, you'll get on the other. That's right. That's right. And There's nothing wrong with it as long as it's meat. <laughs> what you'll find is when you're working with that animal, the basic principles of meat cutting or butchery is you're separating thick from thin and lean from fat. So you'll naturally cut along some of these seams because that's the natural line. So... Uh, when you're cutting off that ham, you'll know where to cut that ham off because that's the natural seam and that's the natural joint. Just just like the loin, that loin runs along the spine that goes up, uh, up to the shoulder. Now, if you don't cut that off and you get a little bit of that, that, uh, that shoulder meat, you're not going to be able to tell it. You may get a little bit smaller uh, of, a, of a bud on it, but, you know, like you said, so what? Um, and, uh, you know, the natural seam of things, the ribs, you may have the whole rib. And it'll be a just as good eating experience, you know. And so you won't have any trouble with that. You'll naturally come to the places to cut as far as if you just remember separating thick from thin and following natural seams, okay? And so uh, that's like on the inside, that 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 actual tenderloin, uh, there's not much you can mistake there. I mean, it's the tender. You can take your fingers and get it out, you know. And that's the best dirty. part on a biscuit anyways. Yeah. Yes, sir. But and uh, the pork, uh, the pork shoulders, uh, it's been happening a lot more than uh, not in the last ten years here, due to the bandsaw. The pork shoulders get it cut up into a pork steak now because it marbles more like a. Uh, some of the hogs actually look like wagyu beef, but it just looks like that pork. It's all those marbles of fat yep. in there, and man, that is one more piece of meat when you put it on the grill absolutely and i always tell folks that you know good steaks come from that there's a good or good roast there's uh there's uh you know seven bone roast and and an arm roast that has the bone in it it's just a, a, a center cut uh a steak you know separating that thick from thin but uh there's also a little butcher's trick too a lot of people buy country style ribs and they think they're getting ribs. Country style ribs is not actually the ribs. You can make country style out of the shoulder, or you can make country style ribs out of the loin. What you literally do, there's two ends to the loin. There's the rib end, there's this, and there's the sirloin end. And on that rib end, it has some of that nice red rose colored rib meat on it. That's so flavorful. And then they'll actually just take it and split that loin down the middle where you have just a white, the the uh, the white center loin steak or the chop, and then you have this rib end, and they'll take and cut slits in that rib end, and they'll call it a country style steak or rib. And there's nothing wrong with that. There is some rib meat on that, but uh, it's fine eating. Uh, and uh, I much prefer that end, anyways. Uh, you know, just a or just that old white center loin meat and that loin. It can be really dry if you don't cook it well. And uh, to me, it reminds me a lot like the like a white chicken breast, boneless, skinless white chicken breast. If it's going to season well, but it's going to taste like what you season it. It don't bring a whole lot of lot of punch with it, you know. No, you're right. Yeah, but um, I really enjoy pork. With, uh, you know, the ears. I or I buy my pup. I I got a little bird dog pup. He. He really likes pig ears. Are we, are we go to Royal oh, King, yeah. and, and uh, uh, he uh, or he enjoys them. But uh, you know, and there's all different kinds of cooking methods for these cuts. There's better uh, cooking methods for some some of the cuts, but 
you know, it's hard to beat a good old fried pork chop, no matter where it comes from. It is. It's really hard to beat them. Uh, you know, and there's a lot of, uh, I don't know what, uh, I guess I, I will have to agree. A lot of the boar meat, if you were talking about that meat earlier in the way it's cut, mm -hmm. and I will have to say that when you do get an old boar and it's wild boar, and those testicles are still in that meat, it is a Oh, strong, strong, strong meat. Well, that's and a I great have found point. That some of the tamed hogs, if uh, if you don't get those out as soon as you take the animal down, it, sometimes it still runs through that meat and it tastes as bad as the other. Oh uh, yeah, I, yeah. I, I I don't recommend that part, but I mean, if you like that, teach his own. Yeah, and, I just don't like to be run out of my own kitchen by a smell that I'm cooking. <laughs> no, no, and that brings a good point that we almost failed to mention. So most of these uh, animals that are going through the food chain are are are, are cut males. So uh, you know, a steer and cattle, and then um, I uh, and then it'll be castrated in, in the uh, in the pork world too. But it removes that testosterone. It removes a lot of that chances of, of off off taste and like if you killed a wild hog you know odds are it's not going to be castrated there's some some older men that had a, had a lot more gumption than me that would catch wild hogs cut them and turn them back loose to catch them later that went along a lot up here in east tennessee but uh you know you're dealing with a wild boar you got to catch it and you're doing something that he does not find favorable at all <laughs> and uh you're sitting him with uh, sending him back in the woods without two things that belong to him and then in hopes of getting him later. But, you know, you take a cut male and that's just going to be better flavorful uh, meat, uh, eating experience. And, you know, talking about meat quality, you know, sex has a lot to do with it. And then also age, you, you know, older the animal, the more tough and the more it's going to be in beef animals, you want it 36 months or less. And, uh, the way that we can finish these hogs now, you know, you can you can finish a hog really quick up to 300 pounds. So you're still not putting an older animal. And the females are usually kept for breeding purposes, so you don't see a lot of them in the chain. But you could, depending on what you got. But, yeah, castration, you know, done early, you know, for the, for the, uh, for the meat benefit is, is uh, definitely worth looking into it and, uh, you can, there's online resources for that. There's vets that come around and, and uh, do that. But um, we always knew the people that knew how to do that and always called upon them because you want to do it when they're manageable. You don't want to be catching a 300, 400 pound boar hog and, and trying to, trying to get that uh, job you know, done. Uh, you was talking about the uh, hogs earlier and uh, raising them. And I, it, it just keyed me on that something that you'd said. I, I think was it not the is it when the pig has after she's bred it was three weeks or three months three weeks three days something like that till they're born. That I sounds that right. right. Or oh, that sounds right. I, I or, or, or I'll have to look into that, but I or I believe that's right. I'm pretty sure it was around that window. But regardless of that, I know I could top out if I had had a hog in the sow and had piglets. Uh, the most I'd had was thirteen out of one. And it was a land race, and she ended up mashing three of them. So we raised 10, and I kept up with that hog. And it was so ironic that I topped those hogs out twice that year out of that same sow, the same period it took them to be born. Three months, three weeks, and three days. And it was in that window of time those hogs was actually topped out at the 300 range. Wow. Or I can find that answer now, real quick. That was, and that was me soaking the feed that year with wheat shorts, soybean, soybean meal. I mean, I was soaking everything, letting it swell. They was drinking all the water they could. It was a daily, every morning, every evening process to feed, take care of water and all. But now I was wanting to just play with it. But yeah. So you're you right. You are spot on. It says gilts, which is a female pig. They reach maturity and are bred at 170 to 220 days of age. After delivering their first litter of pigs, gilts are called sows. Gestation, which is pregnancy, is 114 days or three months. 
three weeks and three days. So okay. spot on. Um, I thought that was right, but I, I, it's been a while since I've raised any. Uh, a lot of the old timers would take a pocket knife and cut the back side of their fingernail here at the cuticle. Mm -hmm. And when it growed out to the end to clip off, the, the sow would have the pigs. They said, now, I never tried that personally. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just a wise tale they would tell. Yeah. Um, yeah. They also said it took 100 pounds to feed the tail to make the tail long with corn, so they'd always cut the tail <laughs> off as well. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, there's a lot of a lot of old things that I like to hear about it, and I enjoy it, and I, I can't prove them wrong, so I'm not going to try, but mm -hmm. I still enjoy hearing them and talking to them, and there's a lot of knowledge there that mm -hmm. one day be lost, unfortunately. But, yeah. Uh, it's, but you're uh, talking about if you've got uh, uh, piglets, uh, you know, Typically, they're usually castrated at two weeks old, and so and uh, and, that, and they're a bar a barrow there. But uh, yeah, you definitely want to look into that if you're going to going to raise your own pigs, and it's 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 well worth doing that. In 4-H, they're they're uh, they're they're castrated the ones that are in the in the uh, shows, especially if they're going to finish it out to a, to a end product, you know, finish that out, but. Uh, out west where there's still some pig farms uh there used to be a lot or, or some pig farms in tennessee i'm not aware of anybody uh, it, uh if there are any it's out in west tennessee but uh you don't see a lot of just commercial pig farms uh here anymore but they had a identification system of uh, notching ears so where they notched it would tell you uh, an identifier placed on their load and how many notches and so uh, they would, or they have a kind of a a notching system where where they would use identifiers. And uh, if you have pigs, you know, I I think pigs are the smartest animal on the farm, as far as livestock go. Um, you got to have a pretty good pen, and you and that pen has to be in the ground that's for somewhat, because they like to root and they're real smart. If they see you go out a gate, they know that. So. Uh, at these 4-H hog shows, it's organized chaos. We like to joke about that, you know, it's it's just whatever goes. You're trying to get those pigs to walk in a circle and and showing off their great attributes. But smart animals uh, got to have a good pen. Um, my coworker here has those cooney cooney pigs, and they're known not to root as bad, so that makes them a little more favorable for keeping them up and and whatever. They have shorter snouts, but um, you know, back in the day, you'd see these 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 hog pens. They'd have uh, piercings in their nose and everything to try to discourage that. And, but it is something to be aware of that you need to have a good space, a good a good space where they can, you know, get get some mud. They need that mud for, because they don't they don't sweat like us, so it keeps them cool. And I uh, and I finish them out that way. But. Uh, I don't know where they sell pigs at up here anymore. I guess they, I don't know where they run them through at. So you may be, or you may have to raise your own pigs if you don't have a good source to buy them from. I agree with that. And, uh, it, it, you know, to anybody that would ever want to try it and do it. And I mean, think about any resource. You had talked about it earlier about feeding them slop. We fed a lot of slop as well. Uh, you know, we would save it what we didn't eat for family gatherings in buckets and literally feed it to them. But there was a one thing that I figured out real quick and watched because I was all about the saving the dollar or two feet of hog. And I tell you, one of the hog's favorite foods that I have figured out through the years is pumpkin. Pumpkin. That's exactly right. It's unreal how much pumpkin they'll eat. And when I grew up, they always call, had a hog pumpkin is what I always heard it called. And it was a it's not, it wasn't as orange as the rest of the pumpkins. Mm -hmm. It was a meteor pumpkin. But they raised that to feed that to them. So what I've done, we got to thinking about it. And I actually asked our local city and county because they would buy that to decorate all these decorations. Instead of throwing those out to landfills and wherever they would throw them to, I would actually make sure I had a trailer or a truck to get those to feed to the pumpkins, to the hogs, the pumpkins. So mm -hmm. it worked out, and uh, it cut way back on my feed bill, and it was towards the end of the hog's life anyway. So it really helped top them out. And, it, you know, it's a, just a, it's a resource if you have never thought about doing. 
there's nothing wrong with asking them. No, no. And our, our, our hogs and, um, growing up and even these Cooney Cooney pigs here that, uh, my coworker has, they love banana peels. It is like wow. ice cream to them. They absolutely love banana peels. Uh, and I never I think could it's, get my meat bananas or onions. And it might just be the Cooney Cooney pigs that like, I don't know, but, uh, we save it for him and, and, and it's high in sugar. And so they love it. It's like a little treat for them, but oh, makes sense. But they're real enjoyable. If you do get piglets, it's a great thing to, to raise and, and have your kids involved. And, um, you know, there's opportunities in 4-H to show them and uh, teach them animal husbandry. And uh, it's also a great, like we mentioned, from start to finish, from hoof to table, showing them that agriculture chain, how to or, or how to raise that animal, finish it out, and then have that end product for for human consumption to teach us. And uh, I would agree with you on the hogs. They are one of the smartest animals. And until a, uh, a mother pig, until she's pregnant and has pigs, piglets, they are probably some of these sweetest and kindest animals that you could ever have four kids to play with. I, I've rarely ever seen a mean hog until they've had little ones, mm. uh, even boars. Uh, you know, I've seen boars monstrous and still have their equipment to make them, and they're still friendly. Uh, it just depends on how you raise them. I mean, it really yeah. does. You can those hogs very friendly, but yeah. I will agree with you. you got to build a good fence. Yeah. They still want to pull out just to play somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, but I tell folks all the time that are getting into agriculture and farming, the best thing that you can see on your farm or the best thing that you can see in your crops, the best thing that you can see in your animals is your shadow. Because that means you're putting the time in and you're being involved and in, uh, in your learning. But uh, with that being like said, that. I think you should uh, put that on a hat. What's that, Travis? I like that. I think you should put that on a hat. Yeah. Well, uh, we've uh, or we've talked a little bit about an hour, so uh, we'll wrap this up and uh, we'll uh, we'll uh, get your questions. If you have any questions, you can contact your local county extension agent, and uh, we want everybody to be involved in in uh, agriculture. And, and this is a great way to do hobby farming or or uh, you know finishing your own products. But uh, Travis, I appreciate you coming by today. It's always a pleasure. I uh, thank you, Ronnie, for the opportunity. Yep. And uh, great to see you as well. All great right. Well, uh, after uh, after this, we'll uh, get to uh, get back into some uh, backyard gardening, and uh, we'll show you some different kinds of domesticated pigs that you can look and look to purchase back on your farm. All right. Thank you, Travis, for joining us. Uh, we will uh, definitely appreciate all the knowledge and everything that you have to offer for us to learn about, you know, how to raise pigs or what people used to do and having some great quality uh, products there for your household. But we'll uh, transition. We mentioned hobby farming. So I have some tasks for you in February. The task for February is now time to, uh, for dormant pruning on many fruit crops. Make sure to remove any diseased wood while pruning for production. Dormant sprays are also an important early season fruit practice. The cool season crops for transmitting uh, are, are right now would be a good time to seed cool season crops for transmitting. Broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, and similar crops will need approximately eight weeks from seeding to transplant. A late March or early April planting will require an early February seeding. Order, remi order remainder of garden seeds for your 2024 garden. Direct seeded crops can be ordered later, but ordering early provides best selection. If conditions allow, you may prepare soil for early seeded cool season crops. Allow plenty of time for cover crops to decompose. I want to give you some helpful trips. Uh, according to University of Tennessee, these are your top three fruit crops to get you started. So blueberries is number one, one of the best options for low spray or organic growing 
Blueberries, especially the rabbit eye types, can be produced for many years if soil and site are well managed. You can check us out for uh, great options uh, for cultivars and things that here at your county extension office. Blackberries are number two. These native fruits to our region can come into a bearing in only one or two years and can produce tasty fruit from early summer to late fall. There are many options that can be upright, hornless, and relatively low maintenance for pests and disease. The third is strawberries. In just around a year, you can have tasty strawberries from your own garden, container, or raised bed. Don't overlook one of the quickest to bear and space efficient fruit crops for the garden. So don't overlook. Uh, for cane berries, such as blueberry or, or I'm sorry, blackberry and raspberry, remove canes that fruited the previous season and then thin the rest. So <laughs> some, some knowledge for you to grow on there. So transitioning before we do, the tree of the month is the tulip poplar. It is a tree for almost any garden. That is the tree of the month in uh, February. Named for its distinctive tulip-shaped blooms, our state tree is the tulip poplar. It is a beautiful tree and can be found in every county in Tennessee. As North America's tallest native deciduous tree, it can mature to more than 150 feet and half as wide. A very popular tree, the tulip poplar. When I teach kids how to identify them, I always say it kind of looks like the Cheshire cat taking a big smile. All right. Switching over quickly to natural resources, let's get geared up for Tennessee turkey season. Tennessee turkey season uh, opens soon. I believe opening date is April the 13th. And they have some hunting regulations. So general turkey hunting regulations, 30 minutes before legal sunrise, legal sunset. Shotguns using ammunition with number four shot or smaller. No restriction on the number of rounds in the magazine. Archery equipment, longbows, recurves, compounds, and crossbows. Sighting devices, including scopes, are legal. Night vision, infrared, and other devices using artificial light to locate wildlife are illegal. Pre-charged pneumatic guns, like air bores that shoot an arrow, is legal for all hunters to use during the statewide turkey gun season. Prohibited acts, baiting, possessing rifles, using handguns, possessing or using electronic calls, Using live decoys and loaded ammunition large than number four shot are prohibited. Turkeys may not be shot or stalked from a boat in Dyer, Haywood, Lauderdale, O'Brien, Shelby, or Tipton counties. Okay, so identifying adult gobblers, you'll need to do so because you're only allowed one jake per season. So a jake is defined by Tennessee Wildlife Resource Agency as the beard, uh, I'm sorry, the adult gobblers, which is not the jake, the adult are, has to have a beard longer than six inches, tail feathers that are the same length, a spur length that is at least a half inch long, wing feathers have white barring all the way around. Has to have at least one of the following of that criteria. So, a six inch beard. If you look, you can see the turkey tail fan on a jake. Those three or four middle ones stand out past the rest. So that would be a great way to tell of a juvenile. And also the barring on the feathers. So nine and ten does not have it all the way to the tip. Those wing feathers on an adult male will have those barring all the way out to the tip. So <clears throat> the spring date uh, for adults are April 13th. They do have a young sportsman on April the 6th or the 7th. So one bearded turkey per day, not to exceed two per season. Only one could be a jake. Okay. 
Alright. And with that sound, I want to take you downtown. We will be discussing this new event coming up. During March the 12th, 13th, and 14th, that is spring break here in Blount County, uh, we are doing a wolf day camp, wildlife outdoor leadership focused day camp. It is um, a fun outdoor recreation day camp for those that are wanting uh, to learn about wildlife and fishery science. Uh, a 4-H membership is required. We can make you a 4-H agent for free as long as you're a resident in Blount County. But you'll learn about wildlife and outdoor fun, archery skills. We'll be shooting some bow and arrow. If you don't have a bow, we'll have that there uh, at the day camp. Bring your sense of adventure and a bag lunch. Limited spaces are available, so register now. They're going quickly. Ages from 11 to 13, and it'll be from 9.30 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. daily here at your Blunt County Extension Office, 1219 MacArthur Road, Maryville, Tennessee. The cost is $50 for all three days. Scan that link, that QR code, for the link to register. If you have more information, you can contact me at rcowan2 at utk.edu or by calling 865-982-6430. If you want your kids to have a good time, uh, sign them up for this outdoor recreation day camp called Wolf. Join the pack. And with that cue, we have to talk about our invasive. And today's highlight is the, the feral hog, the wild hog. We talked hog today, so we're going to continue with that trend. Wild hogs are invasive exotic animals that called, cause extensive damage to crops and wildlife habitat. The damage that wild hogs cause become more common and widespread during the last, teen, last 15 years. They have gone from being present in 15 counties over to nearly 80 of a total of 95 counties. So back in 1999, TWRA, Tennessee Wildlife Resource Agency, made an attempt to control the expansion of wild populations by opening a statewide wild hog season with no bag limit. Unfortunately, it was during this period of unlimited hunting that the hog population expanded the most. Disjointed population hogs begin to occurring in areas of Tennessee where they have never existed before as a result of illegal stalking by individuals who wish to hunt them. In 2011, new regulations were enacted that changed the hog management. Hogs are not regarded as big game animals in Tennessee. In order to remove the incentive to relocate wild hogs, they are considered a destructive species to be controlled by methods other than sport hunting. So now uh, you can still uh, control them. This is the landowner options and responsibilities. Landowners may shoot wild hogs without limit year-round during the day with any weapon and ammunition which is legal for taking big and small game. Landowners may trap bait outside of big game season. Bait may not be used during big game hunting season without an exemption from TWRA. All target animals must be dispatched before removal from traps. Landowners may obtain exemptions from the regional office enabling them to kill wild hogs at night using a spotlight, a spotlight and trap year-round over bait during big game season and other methods approved by TWRA. In addition, landowners in, four, in a four-county area, the Fentress, Cumberland, Pickett, and Overton area may use dogs as a wild hog control method. Family members and tenants that qualify under farm landowner exemption and up to 10 additional designees may help private landowners with wild hog efforts. So there may be wild hog uh, opportunities for you. If you have a landowner, they can sign you as a designee uh, to give you access to removing those. But 
we had mentioned so, a, a couple things from Travis Henson's uh, interview. I'd made a mistake. I'd got Benton and Clifty Farms mixed up. I created a pork cardinal sin. Clifty Farms is around Paris, Tennessee. That's in um, Henry County. That's uh, Clifty Farms area. Benton County is near that, and they have um, kids that participate in the country ham uh, portion of that. But Benton Country Hams is uh, near Madisonville here in East Tennessee. So we have some big-time players in the pork game here in Tennessee. So wanted to clarify that. Also promised showing you some different breeds of domesticated swine. Well, I put wine. We won't look at swine today. We could do an episode on wine later. So, you have a Berkshire, the third most recognized breed in swine in the United States. The Berkshires are known for fast and efficient growth. Uh, for those that are listening, they are a, a dark colored pig. You got the Chester White, originated in Chester County, PA, from which their name was formed. These white hogs have droopy, medium-sized ears, are known for their mothering ability, durability, and soundness. And they have nice muscle uh, characteristics. Duroc is the most is the second most recorded breed of swine. The red pigs with the dripping ears are valued for their product quality, carcass shield, fast growth, and lean growing. Um, efficiency. They also add value through their um, l- uh, longevity in the female line. You see, I, I see that in a lot of butcher shops to rock. They kind of market that breed really well. The Hampshire, the hogs with the belt, that is a black pig uh, with a white shoulder and foreleg with a black neck and head. The hogs with the belt, they're the fourth most recorded breed in the United States, most popular in a corn belt. You have the land race, wild hogs with droopy ears. They're whole in China, spotted. And the most recorded is your Yorkshire, the most recorded breed of swine in North America. They are white with erect ears. They are found in almost every state, with the highest population being Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Nebraska, and Ohio. Yorkshires are known for their muscles with a high proportion of lean meat and low back fat. Soundness and durability are additional strengths. So I hope you enjoyed the show today. I hope you learned a little bit about pork. And if you're not going to grow your own pork, you might have learned how uh, it was done or how we currently do it on the homestead. And if you need any help, be glad to help you. But thanks for tuning in. Our next show will drop uh, in a couple weeks, and it's a special treat. It is a natural resource, heavy focus on one of our favorite the beloved species here in Tennessee, East Tennessee, the black bear. So we'll see you soon.